It's my honor to introduce our next speaker, Diego Alcala. Diego is an attorney with Defensorial Legal and also with the Puerto, Puerto Rico Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys. He is committed to social justice and equity and has led efforts to use data to strengthen amicus briefs that have been submitted to the U.S. Supreme Court regarding inequitable policing in focusing inequitable policing in housing projects in San Juan. Thank you so much for being here, Diego. Thank you. Um, can you hear me or see me? Um, we can hear you and we can see you. You can't, okay, I cannot see me. So um, I'm gonna put up my presentation real quick. There we go. Well, good morning and good afternoon. And thank you all for inviting me to this conference. Can everyone see the screen? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. So um, as Dino has mentioned, my name is Diego Alcalara Boy. I'm in San Juan, Puerto Rico. I'm a criminal defense attorney. I've uh, been practicing for approximately 15 years in Puerto Rico, Virginia, both state and federal courts. I'm also a civil rights attorney. I do primarily prisoner rights, um, but I'm also an abolitionist. And I started my own little uh, videos um, teaching about the abolition movement in Puerto Rico. Um, and finally, because I needed more stuff to do, I started my SJD, which is the PhD equivalent in law. And I'm concentrating on focusing on technology, law um, from a decolonial paradigm and how it's used by the state, how technology uses, uh, surveillance technologies are being used. So just wanted to start it out, uh, everyone, just reminding everyone that according to Mr. Silver Blake, um, he estimates that the average person in the United States commits no less than three federal crimes per day. And I say that uh, because obviously what we've heard um, throughout the time is the disproportionate responses on how the state and is, uses its police power, its criminal law in order to uh, attack certain communities. So from a 2010 report from the American Bar Association, um, I can say that one out of three African-Americans will be in prison and throughout their lifetimes. One in six Latinos will also be in prison throughout their lifetimes. And according to the 2000 census, although indigenous persons represent less than 1%, there's certainly an over-representation um, of them in the prison system, that's 2010. Uh, and at 2000 census, those numbers since then has, have only increased. So the disproportionality is greater. Um, and, but although if you probably look like me or within one of these um, subsections of the community, you may also be charged with a crime. And as you already know, anyone who is accused of a crime under the constitution has the sixth amendment right to have an attorney assist you for your defense. This is not only a constitutional protection, but those who do not have the ability to hire an attorney also can do so. And that's through the famous case, Gideon versus Wainwright uh, out of the Supreme Court in 1963. My job primarily is funded through what's called the Criminal Justice Act, which is a federal statute that authorizes uh, the um, United States district courts throughout the United States to hire independent and private attorneys and, um, and hire them in order to represent indigent defendants facing federal offense, accused of federal offenses. What I primarily do is once I get my client appointed, um, basically the government, probably U.S. attorneys, will provide me with what they have, um, the evidence, which is called discovery, and the government has a requirement uh, to provide certain things prior to trial. Uh, these, uh, I get to uh, receive physical and video evidence, audio recordings. Um, in some cases, I get recordings from helicopters. In other cases, I get 
um, 75,000 pages of documents. So each particular case will be um, a different need um, as to what the data is provided to us. Once I get all that, um, I am, I need to sit down with my client, determine um, if he or she would like to go to trial and if it's in their best interest. One of the considerations that we need to do is look at this wonderful graph, which is basically this book, which contains most of the federal criminal uh, punish um, statutes are inside, uh, converted into a mathematical equation, which provides um, not only defendants, but prosecutors and uh, judges um, a recommended sentencing range, offense levels on the left, which is uh, the column all the way to the left, include the most serious charges would be in, in, the, in higher numbers. And then on top, you'll see Roman numerals, uh, one through six, and that's primarily dealing with someone's criminal history. So we get to do all that math in my job. Now, the reason why I think my um, participation in this event is stems from a recent collaboration that we had with QSide. And just to give you some background, um, there's a case in Puerto Rico uh, called US versus Rodriguez Rivera. It's a federal case in which in 2012, Mr. Rodriguez pled guilty to a particular offense called conspiracy to possess drugs with the intent to distribute. And that's United States 21, United States uh, Code, Section 846. And for that crime in 2012, he was convicted of 24 months. Then in 2012, he was again arrested, but this time he was arrested for a different offense, which is possession of a firearm modified to shoot automatically. And as I mentioned earlier in the earlier graph, you can see that these are the um, offense level on the left column will, will have a starting point based on the offense you're charged with, but they're going to be enhancements for aggravating factors or mitigating factors will make this number increase or decrease. In this particular case, um, the judge and impose an additional two-level offense enhancement, uh, reasoning that Mr. Rodriguez Rivera's 2012 conviction, it's within a definition called a uh, controlled substance offense. So the guidelines stated that if a person in the past has this particular offense, a controlled substance offense, a two-level increase would be added to the total offense level. Um, well, that resulted in an additional six to eight months, and the judge then sentenced him to a term of 38 months in prison. This case then went on appeal, and in 2021, the First Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed the conviction, um, and um, basically the interesting part about this is that not every circuit in the in the appeals court circuits have interpreted this particular offense the same way. So in order to determine if that particular enhancement applies or not, six circuits believe it does and three circuits do not. So there's a split. Because of their, the split, these are one of those locations in which litigants like myself believe that the Supreme Court uh, are more inclined to accept um, in order to address that particular issue. But um, just to give you some background, less than 1% of all petitions of the United, uh, before the Supreme Court are actually granted. And in this particular case, this uh, client was represented by the Federal Public Defender's Office in Puerto Rico, which they themselves filed uh, the cert, cert petition. But they did seek the assistance of the organization I belong to, which is the Puerto Rico Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, in order to file what's called an amicus brief. Basically, an amicus is uh, a report or, or, or a brief um, explaining a particular point 
uh, of interest for the court in support of the brief itself. Um, the points that we wanted to highlight were the geographic differences in sentencing, right? So for this particular offense and that enhancement, if you were arrested in Florida or Puerto Rico, it would be a significant difference as to what the sentencing would be, even though there's a mandate as to uniformity within all, all cases in the United States uh, sentencing. And um, certainly we wanted to explore and instruct the Supreme Court as to what is the impact of this particular offense in Puerto Rico. So we, in order to do that, determined that we would look for cases in which 10 or more defendants were charged with at least one uh, charge of 21 USC 846. And to do that, we went to the data that was found at the PACER system, which is the Judiciary Branch Electronic Filing System, which is a four fee. Um, um, it's, there's a paywall and you need to pay a lot in order to get these documents. But what we wanted to look at specifically, because these are the only documents that we had um, available, uh, were the docket sheets and the indictments. And I'm gonna look for one second. I wanna double check if you can just confirm that you can see my, my screen still. Yes, we can. Yes, thank you. So the indictment is the charge charging document. And in this case, it's docket uh, case number 08281. As you can see, not only does it have uh, signatures and different stamps, uh, it also includes a brief description of the offenses for which um, the people are charged with in this particular offense. What we also wanted to look for in these cases is if there was, as in paragraph one here, object of the conspiracy, if it can identify where in a particular location does the government believe that these conspiracies were uh, occurring. Uh, so we we're able to identify that. A docket sheet would provide us a different set of information. A docket sheet, you can think of as a register and at least all the events that have occurred in a particular case. So the first part that I'm scrolling down to are each particular offendant, uh, defendant, right? In this case, number 15, legal counsel, you can see if it was a CJA appointment, which is Criminal Justice Act appointment, the charge, this position would be how much he was sent, he or she was sentenced. Um, SRT is supervised release terms, that's post-incarceration, how much time they're basically under supervision and a fine. Um, keep scrolling down and you'll see another section in the docket sheet that discusses each particular event throughout the lifetime of the um, case. So hopefully we will be able to see that. But either way, in this second section, it just provides you uh, with more detail as to what happened each day that uh, the system produced uh, an entry. It's more like a electronic registry of what we have. So going back to the presentation. So that's the data that we have. And obviously we wanted to um, highlight what, what, what interesting information we can get. Just to give you a, some um, idea, nationally in the federal system, 26% um, of all cases addressed in federal court are criminal cases while in Puerto Rico, I'm sorry, drug cases while in Puerto Rico, that number goes up to 47%. On the contrary, most cases in federal court, 41% are immigration related. And in Puerto Rico, that number drops significantly to 17%. So just to give you a heads up as to the type of cases that my district deals with primarily. Now, going into this, we had looked at what the jurisprudence on these type of cases uh, stated regarding our clients or, or this practice. So we found United States versus Reyes, that's, uh, there's a, a section that says 110 defendants 
charge in a two count indictment, drugs and firearm, uh, firearm offenses arising from a massive drug ring operation in public housing projects. A second descriptor we found was another describes a vast drug trafficking organization operating primarily out of public housing and implicating three generations of a family of 55 defendants. And, and that's important because we wanted to humanize what this particular offense uh, targeted, or was targeting actually. So um, from those documents we started, we meaning three other attorneys started manually to uh, build a Google Sheet in order to start labeling this. And that was really cool until we realized we weren't gonna be able to complete this. And that's when I reached out on Twitter and luckily QSide was available. Um, and in a period of one week, we were able to work together in order to produce uh, our, our results. From that, we were able to look at that 10, 10 year period with that particular type of cases, we identified that there were 7,000 cases, 7,116 cases filed, and that's the entire docket. Out of that, 131 cases were relate were cases that had 10 or more people with an 846 charge. So that represents 1.8 of all criminal cases. And out of those 131, we identified 98 cases in which the indictment indicated that this was either a public housing project um, or an impoverished area. So we were able to narrow down from these 7,000, uh, which only 1.4% of the cases were actually, uh, that were filed in that period of time, were actually against people that uh, occurred, offenses that occurred in these areas uh, in Puerto Rico. But when we continue to explore the data, from that um, 7,000 cases, there's actually 15,835 people charged in those cases. And out of that 846, the totality, even though in the previous slide, um, it was 1.8% of all cases, this was 34% of all cases filed were regarding this particular offense and specifically regarding uh, people living in public housing on Proverbs that represented 27%. So even though the number filed were, were low because of the magnitude of the amount of people being charged, it represented almost a third of the entire federal docket in a period of 10 years. Now, just to give you some, some I put an asterisk up here on the total person's charge. Um, I wanted to uh, highlight that in one year in Puerto Rico, our state court system will handle over 35,000 people. So even though this, this number might appear high for a 10 year period, we elapse that in state court yearly, almost two, two and a half times. So I just wanted to share what uh, our previous speaker, Manu was one of the graceful participants in, in this experiment and he was able to provide us with this particular graph just to determine uh, length of prison sentences of the people that we analyzed um, and just wanted to show that um, also uh, Dr. Phil Chadro uh, worked in this case and Dr. Carlos Paniagua he has out of Salva Regina also um, participated in helping us um, come up with with what our findings ensuring that we get them. Um, out of the analysis, uh, we were able to identify that from those targeted prosecutions, meaning those prosecutions that dealt with um, public housing, um, temp these locations were 10% poorer than the rest of Puerto Rico. There's a higher unemployment rate and a lower graduation rate between uh, males ages 16 to 34. So again, uh, just wanted to give you more information as to the analysis. This is what uh, they were able to produce. Hope that you're able to see it. So I did not do the math and I do not know what this means, but I just know that uh, it was worked on um, by this group 
and uh, they were able to provide us this very valuable information for us. As you can see, uh, this is the information that, that they were able to provide us with. So going back to uh, the analysis, I just wanted to give you, as I said, um, these locations were actually 10% poorer than the rest of Puerto Rico. And just to give you perspective, in 2020, the poverty rate um, in, in the past, and that just tells you what percentage of the population in 2020 were living in poverty. Now, I understand that these figures, what we were looking at is 2006, 2016, but this number is pretty accurate when it comes to those time periods also. So it's almost 39.8% of the population already live in poverty rates. So we, meaning I myself, had done some updating to these numbers and we I've gone all the way through. We have determined that as of 2016, because of these cases can take a few years to get through the system, we updated the number of persons, the uh, just updated how many people have been convicted and that number increased to 3845, 3800. And the average sentence now is it's 82 months of incarceration terms um, for a total cost of incarceration of for $948 million for 3,845 people, which certainly there may be different ways in which we can use that money in order to create a more safe environment in Puerto Rico. Now, one of the things that I, throughout this experience, um, I was thinking of was how, for example, Dr. Angelo Davis has already mentioned previously that marginalized communities are usually the most surveilled communities by the police. And um, these 846 cases are, are basically built by years of surveillance, years of tracking arrest records um, within certain communities. And as I showed, these communities are the most uh, affected um, economically in Puerto Rico. Um, but their videos or audios recording every sound, every, every images that are either on some point, on some occasions operated by agents, in other occasions, they are not. They're basically standalone um, devices that are being implemented in order for that. And, and I'm, this is the information that I can verify because of the discovery obligations from the government. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm getting everything that they have, right? This is, this is just what they are, saying that they will use against our clients at trial. So that creates a significant amount of questions as to, is that all that you have? I mean, is, is how, what is it that you're not providing? So this is a, it's an unknown unknown as to what they have. And I, and, I, and I bring that up because as far as surveillance and policing in Puerto Rico, we do have a long history of how surveillance and uh, criminal law have been used, um, primarily as a tool under the Spanish regime, right? Uh, to convert everyone to Christianity and to maintain a code of order, moral code. And it was uh, the harshest against obviously slaves, the free black population, poor communities, uh, anyone that was questioning uh, the Spanish authority, so reformers or nationalists, uh, people that wanted Puerto Rico to be free. Uh, so everyone that was not either directly from Spain in Puerto Rico or from the elite criollo class was subject to much harder surveillance. Um, and we have a criminal code, we have black codes in Puerto Rico, uh, AMDOS, which is every time a new governor showed up, he had his own uh, particular set. Of, of, of laws that were not necessarily those approved in Spain, but this was because like a, a, the governor was the one that was in charge. So he would come up with his own laws. And then to enforce them, there were municipal police, military, uh, citizens patrol. And then in 1854, the Spanish Civil Guard, which is a quasi-military um, unit that would be responsible for all rural areas in Puerto Rico. And there were 
particularly nasty results. Uh, the turn of the century, we shifted and were passed on from the Spanish government to the Americans out of the Spanish-American War in 1898. But again, the same sort of situation occurred. Now the United States is broadening its borders into other uh, territories, including territories and colonies into its system. Our experience, we had military codes and penal codes. Actually, our first penal code was brought in from California and other regulatory schemes and the surveillance and, and the primarily was, was targeting uh, initially Catholics, um, laborers, political opponents, again, anyone that was advocating on behalf of Puerto Rico, but then it expanded uh, with the um, Red Scare era, uh, post-World War II, to include students and LGBTQI community members, artists, protesters, and even reggaeton singers, which is one of the targeted groups in the 90s. So we do have an extremely long and um, unconstitutional practice of surveillance and mixing that with the police apparatus. Um, and even though it's, it, there's, there's some um, constitutional issues regarding this technology, um, there are a significant push um, to expand the technology that we have in Puerto Rico on behalf of the police. So it, it's worrisome to me um, because from a critical race theory analysis, then if race is a construct, then we can also say technology is also a social construct and surveillance technologies are certainly out there uh, that we need to take a look at. And my question here would be to challenge everyone just to see what we're building, how is it being used, what can be done, is this inevitable? And um, I just wanted to um, throw that out there because it's it's quite concerning what's going on. So I just wanted to thank everyone for the opportunity. Uh, I hope I made it in time and thank you.